Okay, hello again. So, for my next talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, some updates on use of lung imaging uh, to examine the lung in COPD. And just an outline of my topics. First, I will show you how you can use CT scanning to separate the airway and parenchymal phenotypes of COPD. Then I'll show you that, uh, well, I'll ask the question, does emphysema in asymptomatic smokers predict the development of COPD? Then I will talk a bit about does nutritional emphysema occur in women who have anorexia nervosa? And finally, I'll show you how CT helped us to find out whether COPD due to exposure to biomass smoke produces a predominantly emphysema or a predominantly airway phenotype. So, to start with the separation of airway and parenchymal phenotypes of COPD. As you all know, the major risk factor for COPD is cigarette smoke exposure. And in genetically susceptible individuals, these interact and also probably with respiratory infection and occupational and environmental pollution to produce two different patho pathologic processes. One process, which is based on inflammation in the parenchyma, in the alveolar wall, and apoptosis of alveolar uh, epithelial cells, leads to a loss of lung elasticity, destruction of the alveolar wall, and loss of lung elasticity. And the pathologic mark of that is what we call emphysema. But there's another process, which is airway inflammation, remodeling and thickening and narrowing of the small airways of the lung, which we call sometimes small airway disease. And both of these can occur with cigarette smoking. In some individuals, emphysema is the predominant phenotype. In some individuals, the airway disease, the small airway disease, is the predominant phenotype. In some individuals, both contribute. But the fact that some individuals have predominantly one or the other phenotype suggests that there are different mechanisms and perhaps different genetic susceptibilities. So the reason that we cannot separate these out clinically very easily is that both the emphysema and the small airway obstruction lead to the same physiologic abnormalities. So loss of lung elasticity and airway narrowing produced decreased expiratory flow, hyperinflation of the lungs, and abnormalities of gas exchange. So we can't, unless we have the pathology, unless we have the lung, we cannot easily uh, tell if it's predominant airway or emphysema. Now, if we have the lung as pathology and autopsy, then we can measure emphysema. You can methods to put uh, morphometric techniques to measure the percentage of the lung that is occupied by emphysema spaces. But what CT has allowed us to do is to, to quantify that emphysema without autopsy, so in life. And you can do this because you can see those emphysematous holes on CT scan. Now, what radiologists like to do is to look at pictures and, and give scores or say abnormalities. So the radiologists can say that there's emphysema, and they can even quantify it to some extent by giving a subjective emphysema score from zero up to five for so very big emphysematous spaces. But the beauty of CT scanning is that it's not only a picture, it's data. Right? So a CT scan is made up of uh, uh, digital data on the density of the lung. So you can take a CT slice like this and you can plot it as the density of all the voxels, all the pixels that make up that whole lung. And you can do a frequency distribution of that. So 
here is Aquí the percentage of the boxes. So de los that's boxes, many, boxes, many hundreds and thousands of little uh, de miles voxels. De boxels. And here is the Hounsfield unit. Well, well Hounsfield is the guy who invented the CT scan. So he uses, he used, they use Hounsfield units to measure density. In fact, it, it, Hounsfield units of minus a thousand is the same density as air. And Hounsfield unit of zero over here somewhere is the same density as water. So the lung is made up of water and air. So the density is between air and water. And for all the voxels, we can get this frequency distribution. Now, Hounsfield units is a bit of a uh, funny unit, but we can convert Hounsfield units into lung density, because all the CT scanner is is a measure of density. It's only measuring density. So we can convert uh, these units into density, so here would be lots of air and very little tissue, this would be very emphysematous lung, and the normal lung is around here, a density of around 0.15, but there is a frequency distribution even in normal. Now you can also convert this lung density to the reciprocal of lung density, which is lung inflation, so instead of grams per ml, you can convert it to ml per gram. So normal lung is about, uh, you know, about six to seven ml of gas for every gram of lung tissue. Now, the beauty of this is since emphysema is defined by lung destruction, leading to increased air and less tissue, then we can use yeah, so that increased air and less tissue means a decrease in grams per ml or an increase in ml per gram. So we can use these CT to measure the amount of emphysema. And, and one way of doing that is to uh, establish a threshold, to make a cutoff. And say, a cutoff is defined based on the Hounsfield units or more conveniently grams per ml or ml per gram, and all the voxels beyond that threshold are defined as emphysema, or what we sometimes call the percentage low attenuation area. So all of these voxels here are, have too much air and not enough tissue, and we would define those voxels as having emphysema and these as not having emphysema. So then you can take an image and not just have the radiologist give you a score, you can calculate what percentage of the area of the lung is uh, too much air and not enough tissue and define an emphysema uh, score. So this we call the low percentage, percentage of the lung area that has low attenuation. So that's an emphysema score. And now we can also look at the distribution of the emphysema. So sometimes you see with emphysema that there are, there are few large emphysematous spaces, and other people have many smaller emphysematous spaces, and that might have significance. So not only can we say what percentage of the lung is occupied by emphysema, we can say is it large, large emphysema spaces or small. And to, to quantify that, we can actually plot the number of emphysematous spaces here versus the size of the emphysematous spaces. And as you'd expect, there's, there's usually more small spaces and fewer large spaces. But some individuals have uh, many small and few large spaces, and some individuals have more, uh, fewer small and more large. And you can fit a line to that, and the slope, the negative slope, D, it defines whether or not, so a, a low D means a low slope, means large emphysema spaces, a high D means a steep slope, means less large spaces. So in this example, this person would have a, a lower value for D, big space. This person has a higher value than D, small. Okay. 
Now, how about the airways? Well, you can also see the airways on CT, and you can measure the airway dimension. And the radiologist also will tell you sometimes, oh, these airways are thicker, right? This patient has thick, narrow airways. And I think even you can appreciate that these airways are thicker than that. But that's a very subjective thing. So we can also make measurements of airway wall thickness. So you can blow up those airways. You can define the airway lumen, internal area, and the airway wall. And the way we quantify the airway wall remodeling is by the wall area percent, which is the wall area divided by the wall area plus the lumen area. So it's the percentage that is made up of tissue. So now we have two scores. We have an emphysema score, percent low attenuation area, and we have an airway score, which is the wall area percent. And a former fellow of ours, Dr. Yasu Nakano, in Japan, used this technique to look at COPD patients. So he caught it on this axis, the low attenuation area, so that's the measure of emphysema. <coughs> And on this axis is the wall area percent, that's the measure of airway wall remodeling. <coughs> and examined 100 patients with COPD and compared them with 20 patients who were smokers but were asymptomatic. And so what he found here are the in pink, are the, the non-symptomatic non smokers. He found that in many of the, the COPD patients, they had an increased emphysema score, but they overlapped the, non, the asymptomatic smokers with the wall area score. There were other COPD patients who had increased airway thickness, increased wall area percent, but they overlapped the non-symptomatic smokers with respect to the emphysema score. So you can see that there was an emphysema dominant group, an airway dominant group, and then people with mixed disease. So you can categorize uh, patients with emphysema, with COPD, into airway predominant or emphysema predominant based on CT scan. <coughs> now, what I won't show you is, is we've also done studies in large uh, genetic studies to show that the, the dominant pattern is, is familial. So if two uh, brothers smoke and one develops predominant emphysema phenotype, their brother who smokes also develops predominant emphysema phenotype, and the same with airway phenotype. So there's a heritable component to these phenotypes. Okay, so that's number one. You cannot, you can separate these phenotypes. Another question that a fellow asked who worked with was, does emphysema in asymptomatic smokers predict the development of COPD? So what she did, was she uh, recruited 149 patients who were having screening CT scans for lung cancer. So these are individuals who smoked a lot, male and female, uh, about age 60. A few current smokers, mostly ex-smokers, and you can see they, they pack years is very high. But they had normal lung function, so they were selected to have normal lung function. They were selected from about a thousand patients. And then we followed them for four years. So we measured lung function for the next four years. And then we plotted the change, the change in FEV1, that's a measure of lung function, against the emphysema score at baseline, so before the, before the four years. And what we found is that the more emphysema they had at baseline, the more rapid was their subsequent decline in lung function. So CT emphysema, evidence of emphysema on CT, not only means you have emphysema, but it predicts a more rapid decline in lung function in the future. It's like a biomarker, Luis. Okay, so... Um, Next, 
I'll tell you about Ahora, some studies we did to look at uh, whether or not women with anorexia develop emphysema. And you might ask, why would we ask this question? Well, there's some evidence that severe malnutrition is associated with emphysema-like changes in the human lung. <clears throat> this was reported first during the, the war in the Warsaw Ghetto, where uh, some individuals did 378 autopsies of adults who died of starvation in the Warsaw Ghetto. And of those, 50, uh, of those 378, 50 had a significant emphysema. So 13% had emphysema. And 40 of those 50 patients were under the age of 40 years, where you wouldn't expect significant emphysema. So uh, the modern, a modern-day uh, starvation model is anorexia nervosa. So uh, the hypothesis was that long-term protein calorie malnutrition would result in emphysema-like changes. And we also wondered if the emphysema changes in the lungs would improve with nutritional recovery if, if the patients were cured of anorexia. So we, re we recruited and measured lung inflation by CT, mLs per gram, in 21 anorexia patients and 16 controls. And this is the result. So these are, the, remember I showed you those different cutoffs, 6 mLs per gram, which is normal lung, 6 to 12 mL per gram is maybe a little bit emphysema, and then more than, more than 10 mL per gram is mild to moderate emphysema. So in normal lungs, you can see that most of the lung is 6 mL per gram, a little bit uh, at, at 6 to 10, and very little bit more than 10. In smokers, you can see that there's increased lung with low attenuation, uh, 10 mL per gram, and increased uh, intermediate. And in anorexia patients, and these were very young women, there's also increase in low attenuation lung. So these young women have emphysema. And when we looked at it in relationship to BMI, so here is the mean lung inflation, mLs per gram. So a higher number means more inflation, more emphysema. And here is body mass index. These are the control group. These are the anorexia patients. And you can see that the more uh, the BMI was lower, the more the emphysema, the lung had emphysema changes. Now, in some individuals, we were able to follow them uh, over a period of uh, two years, and this is a plot of the change in BMI, so the people who increased weight is going up, decreased weight is going down, and this is the change in lung inflation, so increased lung inflation, worse emphysema this way, a decreased lung inflation, uh, better emphysema this way. You can see that those who had an increase in lung weight, in, in body weight, had an improvement in lung uh, attenuation. And those who, there's only three, but those who uh, lost more weight or became more anorexic uh, had an increase in lung inflation. So perhaps this is partially reversible. Okay, so the last thing I would like to tell you about that we can use CT for is a study that we did with colleagues in Mexico. And in Mexico, uh, like in, in Colombia, I think, in the cold mountain uh, regions, uh, they use wood, wood smoke for cooking. And because it's cold, they cook inside, and the women are exposed to very high concentrations of wood smoke. And we asked the question, is the lung look different if you have COPD from wood smoke versus COPD from cigarette smoke? So this was only 12 subjects. We had 12 subjects, women, age 69, uh, who had biomass uh, COPD. So they, their biomass exposure, we invented a exposure index hour years, so that's the average number of hours per day times years of wood smoke exposure, and they did not smoke cigarettes. And then the other group, the tobacco group, 
y luego had, hicimos un grupo uh, de fumadores de tabaco. Uh, cigarette smoke exposure, but no wood smoke exposure. Pero no estaban expuestos a el humo de leña. Ellos trabajaron, tenían ambos grupos un so cierto grado de the pop. Cuando data, miramos los datos cuantitativos, the percent low attenuation el porcentaje area de área de la biomasa baja en el grupo de biomasa y el grupo de tabaco fue muy similar. That didn't Así appear to be different, no but the wall area percent was significantly, well, almost significantly increased in the biomass group, suggesting that there was more airway disease uh, in the biomass group. And then when we did the cluster analysis, there was a slope D, the biomass group had a significantly higher slope, meaning that the emphysematous spaces, if they had them, were much smaller. Uh, and that was significant. So we also got the radiologists to look at these and score them. And here is the score by the radiologist for the emphysema, the biomass group going from zero to five. So when the radiologists looked at them, they didn't know which was which. When they looked at the biomass exposed CTs, they scored much lower for emphysema than in the tobacco group. So I think what this shows is the biomass, if it produces emphysema, it's very small holes that the radiologists can't see. Uh, but we also got them score this expiratory CT scan. So you can do a, a CT can scan after expiration. You get them to breathe out, do another CT scan, and you can measure gas trapping, how much gas is trapped in the lung. And when we did that, the biomass group has significantly more gas trapping score than the tobacco group. Again, suggesting that they have more airway disease causing uh, gas trapping. So, in summary then, I've shown you that CT can be used to separate individuals who have emphysema predominant from airway predominant uh, COPD. COT, CT can distinguish uh, the distribution and the pattern of emphysema, whether it's big holes, small holes, upper lobe, lower lobe. The predominant pattern of COPD uh, is emphysema or airway disease is heritable, so it's familial. Emphysema in non-obstructed smokers predicts subsequent decline in lung function, so it's a predictor of development of COPD. Emphysema-like changes occur in the lungs of malnourished humans and are partly reversible. And finally, biomass smoke exposure causes an airway predominant form of COPD. And most of these studies were done in, in collaboration with uh, one of my colleagues that I show you this picture because he's so important in these studies, Harvey Cox. Uh, but there's also many other students and fellows uh, involved in these studies, and these are my uh, next in, uh, colleagues that were involved in the, uh, the biomass study. Thank you.